Did you know that C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, author of The Lord of the Rings, used to belong to a literary club at Oxford called The Inklings, where they would read each other's works to one another for feedback? And did you know that Lewis wholeheartedly supported Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, so much so that Tolkien even said later, the unpayable debt that I owe to Lewis was sheer encouragement. But did you also know that when Tolkien read Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he told Lewis that it was terrible because witches and Father Christmas and talking animals and figures from Greek and Norse mythology should never be thrown together in the same story? He was highly disapproving of it. Thankfully, though, Lewis listened to his other friends who loved the book, and so it was published in 1950, and it led to the publication of another six books, which is now known as The Chronicles of Narnia, a series that has since been adapted in some part or another for television, radio, the stage, film, and even video games. Now, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a children's book, and this, I think, is so crucial to understanding how this book is designed, its use of mythology, theology and Christian stories, its genre as fantasy, and its intention as a supposal, all of which we're going to explore in this lecture today. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Whitney Costers, Professor of English, offering full lectures and analyses of classic literature here on YouTube. So please subscribe to my channel if you're interested in learning a bit more about the books that continue to be talked about, including a number of canonical children's books. And since we're discussing a children's book today, I'm here to remind you that just because it's a children's book doesn't mean it can't lend itself to real substantial critical thinking and literary analysis. Too often, I think, children's books are written off as simple stories or just a kid's book, but I think we really do a disservice not only to the literature, but also to children's imaginations and the way in which they perceive and understand the world. Because truly, I think that we adults can benefit from remembering what it was like to think like a child sometimes. And to be honest, this novel is pretty heavy in its philosophy and theology, so get ready. I think it's really crucial to know a bit about Lewis's relationship with Christianity in order to fully appreciate this novel. Lewis lost his Christian faith early in life and remained a proclaimed atheist until his early 30s. But religious discussions with Tolkien prompted Lewis's conversion to Christianity, after which he authored writings that were religiously oriented. And later in life, Lewis wrote an essay called Myth Became Fact, in which he shares many of the ideas that he learned from and discussed with Tolkien about mythology, religion, and truth. In it, he writes, to be truly Christian, we must both assent to the historical fact and also receive the myth, fact though it has become, with the same imaginative embrace which we accord to all myths. What flows into you from the myth is not truth, but reality. Truth is always about something, but reality is that about which truth is, and therefore every myth becomes the father of innumerable truths on the abstract level. So let me explain to you what he means by this. To Lewis, mythologies are not just fictional stories. They are stories that convey reality because they give us the means to fully grasp and understand and feel abstract concepts such as love, loss, betrayal, and hope. While we can reason over the meaning behind these concepts, they are inevitably lost to abstraction. But when they are conveyed through story or myth, our experience of them is triggered and is felt to the core. They suddenly become less of concepts and meaningful human experiences unique to us. And this becomes particularly useful for children who may not have the sophistication, maturity, or the intellect yet to grasp the philosophical meaning of abstract concepts. So we can teach a child about the abstract concept of loss, or we can tell them the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, in which Orpheus loses Eurydice twice, once to a snake bite and once after a treacherous journey into the underworld, full of hope that he can bring Eurydice back to life. Orpheus gets his chance to have Eurydice return with him as long as neither of them looks back on their way out of Hades. But upon seeing the sun, Orpheus is so excited, so full of love for Eurydice that he accidentally turns around to share his excitement with her, only for her to disappear forever. Such a story encourages us to empathize with Orpheus because we feel the pain of Orpheus being stripped of his love. 
The story invests us in his loss, especially since we have experienced loss in some way or another, whether that be the death of a loved one, the loss of a child's favorite toy, a friend moving away, or a broken relationship. Now, Lewis takes us one step further in that he argues that the Christian myth is a fact, since Jesus' existence is an historical fact. But the idea that Jesus is God, you know, and more than Balder, the Norse God, who dies and comes back to life, is fact. But that fact is no less mythology in that it still expresses human emotions in a way that conveys reality. So to Lewis, it's not the interpretations and teachings so much as the mythology that is at the heart of religion. And we can see how he implements this idea throughout The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe for his young readers. The story of the four Pevensi siblings journeying through this fantasy land called Narnia, encountering talking animals, magic, and a witch, is the mythology that conveys to children the story of Jesus Christ, sacrifice, salvation, and resurrection, as well as the concepts of loyalty, betrayal, forgiveness, temptation, trust, support, family, and faith. But it does not just convey these concepts. Lewis shows us what each of the Pevensi siblings does with these concepts, what they learn from them, and how they are each changed by them from ordinary kids to playing hide and seek to kings and queens willing to fight and sacrifice themselves for good over evil. And by making The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe a fantasy, Lewis connects the story to children's imaginations, their fascination with magic and pretend, and gives them a world that is far removed from their real lives, a world in which it is much safer to think about loss, death, and betrayal. And it's important, I think, that the Pevensi children are not naturally already part of Narnia, because they need to be relatable to the reader. Lewis gives us four ordinary children of different ages living a sheltered and somewhat orphaned life since they've been sent to live in isolation with an old professor who is absent more than present. It's only through a mundane game of hide and seek that they discover an incredible magical world in which their loyalty, love, and characters will be explicitly and immediately tested and tried with very real consequences. And even though they, like the reader, are just as taken aback at the magical world of Narnia, they don't enjoy the privilege or the safety that the reader maintains from a distance. The reader gets to escape and live vicariously through Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy's experiences without the real fear of being turned to stone, held captive by an evil witch, or being outright killed. And it is here, too, that both the characters and the reader are presented with the story of Christ, his betrayal, his suffering, and his resurrection, but in a fantasy world. Even as dark and graphic as Aslan's death in the book is, there is something quite distinct and different about a lion in a mystical world being killed by an evil witch than a man being crucified by his fellow humans. The use of fantasy and mythology help temper the story of Christ for children and perhaps make it more bearable, approachable, and relatable for them. Now, you can't read this novel and not pick up on its Christian undertones. Lewis is clearly conveying the gospel messages as he understands them. We have the four siblings, the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. Edmund, tempted by Turkish delight and power, betrays his family, an act that is reminiscent not just of Esau, who is condemned for selling his birthright for red stew to his brother Jacob, but also of Judas, who betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And such a betrayal requires a just punishment, one that is brutal and humiliating, which Aslan endures on the sacred stone, reminiscent of the tablet upon which the Ten Commandments are recorded, just as Jesus dies for the sins of others on the cross. Aslan, like Jesus, rises again and both resurrect others. Aslan breathes life into the petrified victims of the White Witch, while Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto his followers. Jesus feeds the multitudes with bread and fish, just as Aslan provides food for the army after defeating the witch. As Jesus sets up his kingdom of priests on earth, so too does Aslan set up the Pevensi children on the four thrones, and both promise to return. As the symbols of light and dark are portrayed in the Gospel of John, so too is good and evil presented by warm light and the stark colorless environment of a winterized Narnia. And as in Eden, humans in Narnia are the rightful rulers who can maintain paradise when they are good and obedient to the creator. And, of course, the white witch who tempts Edmund with the prospect of power and Turkish delight is comparative to the serpent in the Garden of Eden and Satan in the wilderness. 
So as is pretty obvious, Narnia is imbued with familiar Christian stories, ideas, and figures. But according to Lewis, and this is important, it's not a Christian allegory and so should not be read as such. Instead, it is a supposal. Aslan, according to Lewis, is not an allegorical representation of Christ. He is Christ. He is the answer to the question, what if Christ became incarnate in another world as another sentient being? What if he appeared in an entirely different universe, another reality? What would happen? Thus argues Lewis, a supposal is not allegorical. It is analogical. So while we can compare them, we understand that they are not one and the same. This is why Aslan can die for one person only, not for all humankind. This is why Susan and Lucy can perform the roles of the two Marys at Aslan's execution, or why Edmund can be reminiscent of Judas but be redeemed rather than hanged. As one scholar argues, the general meaning of Aslan's death is very similar to the meaning of the death of Christ in our world, but one does not need to know or refer to the story of Christ to gain that meaning. The story itself conveys the magic of grace, which is more important here than the idea or theology behind the magic. What matters then is not trying to align the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe to Christian symbols per se, but rather to convey the concepts in a new reality. And in writing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lewis essentially creates his own mythology, known to us as the Chronicles of Narnia, by amalgamating other mythologies in order to create a new reality specific to and appropriate for children. And as weird as it may seem, this is exactly why Father Christmas can exist in the same realm as ogres and fawns. Because it's less about who is in there and more about the ideas that they stand for. The mythology incarnates the ideas, which in turn becomes our reality. In other words, Lewis, as I see it, is revitalizing old ideas in a new world called Narnia. And this is exactly why we cannot read them as allegorical. The Chronicles are not meant to remind us of things. They are intended to help us, children in particular, to understand concepts in a new experiential way. To truly understand Lewis's work, I do think that you need to familiarize yourself with his theology and his understanding of religion, which can be pretty heavy at times. Now, I've talked about Lewis and religion at length with a really good friend of mine. His name is Hector Amaya, who happens to be a professor of theology, history, and philosophy, Harvard trained, and I'm still working on fully grasping Lewis's theology in relation to his work. So don't be discouraged if you may feel the same. And if you're interested in the intersections of mythology, its origins, and its development over time, please check out Professor Amaya's working website, which I've linked in the description box below. It's some really good stuff. Now, you can't really discuss The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe without discussing the hero's journey or the monomyth, a common narrative framework found in mythological stories and beyond. According to Joseph Campbell, the scholar who coined the term, there are 17 stages that the hero completes on this journey in which a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. The monomyth can be found in Star Wars, the Odyssey, Harry Potter, Coraline, the Wizard of Oz, and of course, the Chronicles of Narnia. Often, the hero's initial circumstances are pretty ordinary, mundane, common. Luke is a farmer in Star Wars, Harry lives in a closet, and the Pevensey children are just passing the time in a big, empty house, their circumstances deliberately made mundane and safe as a world war rages on in London. And this journey is not intentional, it is entirely accidental, but the children do have the ability to return to the earthly, more ordinary realm, but ultimately return to Narnia of their own accord. And Lucy in particular, unlike her siblings, feels especially compelled to save Mr. Tumnus since he had shown her real kindness, which means putting themselves at great risk and sacrifice. So even though all four of the Pevensey siblings venture into Narnia and they're tested, they sacrifice and are significantly changed in the end, I would argue that Lucy is the focal hero of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. It is she who discovers this new world, who insists on saving Mr. Tumnus, who has the closest bond with Aslan, and it is she who is prioritized in the narrative. 
the youngest of the siblings, Lucy starts out as innocent, naive, good, and is frustrated that of all the siblings, she possesses the least amount of agency. Understandably, when she tells Peter, Susan, and Edmund about her first adventure into Narnia, none of them believes her, and she is unable to fully articulate its truth. And she is no match for Edmund's spite and lies and the dishonor he brings on her when he, after visiting Narnia himself, betrays Lucy and tells the older siblings that Narnia is a pretend place, one that he and Lucy simply made up. But it's in the wardrobe, this liminal space, that leads her into Narnia, a space, a trope really, for the imagination that Lucy not only finds and develops her voice, but where her natural convictions to decency and goodness can thrive and seriously impact the outcome of many lives and the state of Narnia in general. This is an environment in which she can fully evolve her identity and self because the stakes are high and the risk is great. And it's here that the children are unrestricted by adult control and so are fully allowed to make their own choices and do what they feel is necessary in order to grow, develop, and transform from a child to a more mature young adolescent or, in Lucy's case, an uncertain passive child into a more self-assured and confident one. And this, of course, includes Edmund, whose circumstances, for me anyway, are a bit gray. Generally speaking, Edmund's full betrayal against his family begins when he encounters the White Witch, who happens upon Edmund at a time when he is cold, hungry, and in a state of discomfort and fear. Like Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by the devil with the prospect of power and food, so too is Edmund in this vast winter wonderland by the White Witch. But unlike Jesus, Edmund readily accepts the witch's offer of a hot drink and his food of choice, which is Turkish delight, a sweet jelly treat. And as he stuffs his face full of the candy, Edmund, distracted by the physical pleasures, reveals vital information about his siblings, Mr. Tumnus, and their whereabouts, and promises to bring them to the White Witch in return for more Turkish delight and the opportunity to become the prince and later king of Narnia. Edmund is often characterized by readers as an embittered, spiteful boy, tired of Peter's authority, emboldened by Lucy's docile, pure nature to bully her, and willing to betray his entire family for the prospect of power and candy. But I don't know that it's so easy to characterize him as simply greedy for power and materialism. It's there for sure, but it does not take into account the fact that Edmund is an extremely vulnerable moment and is literally drugged by the White Witch. In a matter of minutes, Edmund has become full-on addicted to this magic Turkish delight, which we are told is enchanted, and anyone who had once tasted it would want more and more of it, and would even, if they were allowed, go on eating it till they killed themselves. And of course, the White Witch knows this, which is why it's offered up in the first place. If you look at the interactions between Edmund and the White Witch prior to his consumption of the drug, he is confused, vulnerable, scared, and very uncomfortable. In fact, she calls him an idiot because he doesn't answer her at first. He doesn't give her the information she wants. And when she tells him to get in the sled with her, Edmund only does so out of fear. We're told Edmund did not like this arrangement at all, but dared not disobey. Edmund is shivering and his teeth are chattering due to the cold winter air and the witch's offer of a hot drink is comforting. The narrator says that Edmund felt much better as he began to sip the hot drink. It is only once he begins to ingest the Turkish delight, the drug, that he begins to tell the witch what she wants to know. And mind you, she doesn't betray her real intentions. Edmund does not know that she means to harm them. So while he should be suspicious, he's not outright trying to betray them in this moment. Really, he's just trying to get more Turkish delight. It's said that once the Turkish delight is finished, Edmund looked very hard at the empty box and wished that she would ask him whether he would like some more. And when she asks him to bring his siblings to her, he says he'll try as he stares at the empty box and then, like a true addict, begs her to go to her house right now so that he can get more Turkish delight, completely forgetting his initial fear that this lady was going to take him to some unknown place. But the witch says, no, not until he fetches his siblings, and then strategically throws in the fact that her house has whole rooms full of Turkish delight. And even still, Edmund, whose mouth and fingers are sticky from the drug, continues to ask why they just can't go now, even begging for just one more piece on his journey home. 
And later, when he learns that she is actually a very dangerous witch, we're told that he feels very uncomfortable, but he still wants one more taste of that Turkish delight more than he's ever wanted anything before. And it's this addiction, this chemical, physical need for a drug that drives Edmund's choices in the novel. And it's not just a drug. We all know how addicting hard drugs can be, but this is an enchanted drug. It's magic designed specifically to create a hardcore addiction. I mean, can you imagine being on like enchanted meth? You'd probably sell out your siblings too. And by the time he leaves Narnia for the first time, Edmund, a young boy, is unsettled and is feeling very sick. So how much blame can we place on Edmund for the poor choices he makes in the novel? How much is out of spite and how much is out of a true chemical addiction? Does he really deserve the reader's judgment and aversion? Please let me know your thoughts on this down below because I really think this needs to be taken into account and yet it's often ignored entirely. All in all, Edmund is not an evil villain, which is why he has the opportunity to evolve and repent to transform into King Edmund the Just. If you've read all seven books, then you'll know that the last chapter of the last book refers to the Shadowlands, during which Narnia is destroyed and all of the Pevensies and the good citizens of Narnia pass over into true Narnia, the Narnia they were always looking toward. This is, it seems, an appeal to Lewis's platonic idealism, the idea of a true Narnia. As one scholar writes, to Lewis, ideas form the basis of humanity's attempt at creation. So this is us going back to the reality of mythology here. It's said that in Narnia, ideas become real. This is part of the ontology of Narnia as a created reality. This is a supposed ontology with its own internal coherence. So this further proves the point that the Chronicles of Narnia is a mythology in its own right, one with its own reality upon which we as readers can impose our ideas. In other words, as I discussed earlier, the myth itself is reality. This life is temporary. So when we go to heaven, we see things as they are. And only by reading the scriptures and mythology now do we get a taste of that reality. This is why the children while on earth or the temporal material world are always looking to Narnia, which as we know is imperfect. And this is why in Narnia, they are always looking toward the true Narnia, which is what Christians call heaven. This is the eternal immutable reality as Plato would say. Let me know what your thoughts are on this as well. So no matter if children even pick up on Lewis's theological and philosophical assertions, they do see the differences between good and evil, the need for loyalty, family, and the importance of standing up for what is right. By giving us this myth of the world of Narnia, Lewis has not just created a fun, enriching fantasy world that helps young readers understand the love and sacrifice of Christ, but also a new ontological experience for young readers to experience their own reality, their own ideas uninhibited by adults. Thanks so much for joining me here today and feel free to check out some of my other lectures on children's literature like Coraline, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Giving Tree, and Where the Wild Things Are. I'll see you guys there.